Happy New Year everyone, it's Jason Blaha here and it's time for the Q&A so let's go ahead and get this started. Uh, let me put on my hat first and uh, get to the first question. Is it okay if your lower back feels a little worked or even slightly sore for a day after doing heavy deadlifts uh, in good form? Or is this an indication of not staying tight enough in the start of the lift? All right, that's a good question. And you know, uh, lower back is one of those, it's very, very tricky. Your lower back in general, particularly on an exercise like the deadlifts, can be tricky. Um, and there's a lot of opinions out there on this topic. And uh, as someone who personally deadlifts two or three times a week, and if you guys recall at different points in my life, I've been admitted to deadlifting up to five or six days a week. Uh, in fact, for a while I was pulling six days a week uh, for you guys while I was living in the UK uh, during my off-season powerlifting. And uh, my own experiences with high-frequency deadlifting. Uh, you know what? Sometimes you're going to have a little lower back soreness. If you're using very, very heavy workloads on the deadlift, you're occasionally going to have doms. And by heavy workloads, I mean your total weekly tonnage uh, gets really heavy. Or you're doing AMREPs. Like if you're doing deadlifts for as many reps as possible with a moderately heavy weight, anything uh, up above 75% of your max, and you're doing AM reps, you know what? You're going to get sometimes some lower back cramps. If you're doing very high frequency deadlifting, you're going to get a little bit of cramping and soreness in your lower back from time to time. Uh, what you need to be looking for, of course, is sharp pains. Anything that becomes uncomfortable, noticeably uncomfortable after you're out of the gym. Because sometimes you're going to get some cramping in the gym after you do some very, very serious workloads on the deadlift. Uh, it does happen. Sometimes it can be almost debilitating for five or ten minutes. Uh, again, it goes with the territory with very high workload deadlifting, whether it's due to weekly workload, single session workloads, frequency. Uh, these things will happen from time to time. You have to learn to deal with them. However, what they can also be, if you're experiencing frequent soreness in your lower back, uh, it's probably time for you to deload. Uh, so sharp pains are definitely out. When you're experiencing sharp pains, you need to lay off all your lower back work for a little while and figure out what's going on. Let it heal, let it rest. Uh, remember, sharp pains are oftentimes indication of damage. Cramping and soreness, uh, particularly frequent DOMS, not one-off DOMS, like maybe once every week or two somewhere in there, you get a little bit of DOMS for a day in your lower back. That can happen in the lower back. Um, because again, the lower back is the slowest recovering muscle in the body. Spinal erectors recover very, very slowly compared to many other muscle groups. Um, they can handle a pretty high workload for their size, but they do recover slowly. So sometimes DOMS are going to happen if you're pushing them to their limits. However, if you're getting DOMS frequently, you're getting DOMS every time you train your lower back, it might be time to deload. If you're getting cramping in your lower back from training, uh, not the one-off ones, but I would say if you get three deadlift sessions in a row where you're getting lower back cramping, or spasming in your lower back, it's also time to take a deload. Uh, these are signs that you have exceeded your recovery ability of your lower back, that your weekly tonnage and workload that you're subjecting it to is simply too much. It's time to back it down a notch. And there are times when you need to do that. You've got to check your ego at the door and say, okay, I'm deadlifting or pulling or doing whatever I'm doing to my lower back with these big heavy movements. Um, I've ex I'm exceeding my recovery ability, and if I keep doing this, I'm going to hurt myself. But I'm also stimulating an enormous amount of growth and adaptation. So now, if I just back off a little bit, and that's what you need to tell yourself. Remind yourself to check your ego at the door, because now you've already done the work. Now it's time to claim the reward. All right, so in this case, you need to back it down a notch, let it recover so that you can adapt and grow and get bigger and stronger from that work that you've already put in. You know, it's one of those things to where sometimes you need to take a day off from your job to go collect your paycheck. You know, that sort of situation. Think of it in those terms. Or take a well-earned paid vacation to where you get a big fat check at the end of the vacation. you got to look at it that way when you're putting in work with things like deadlifts and stuff sometimes. Um, because you can work yourself into the ground with an exercise like the deadlift, particularly your lower back. Uh, so sometimes these can, these can be signs that it's time to back it back down a notch. Bring it in, reel it in, recover, adapt, grow. Alright, next question. Uh, with doing GPP, which stands for General Physical Preparedness, Three times a week be enough for overall cardiovascular health, or should I do some less cardio on top of it anyways? Uh, I don't compete in anything, so I don't need it for a specific sport, but I do enjoy getting stronger and hitting PRs. 
uh, but I also want to stay fit and healthy. I also do GBP pretty much for fun and find it a lot more enjoyable than traditional cardio. I usually do farmer's walks, flip tires, sled drags, prowlers, etc. Uh, my gym has a strong fan area that allows me to do all these things, which is awesome. Well, honestly, most of your conditioning can be handled from GPP work, and it sounds like you're doing a wide variety of GPP, which is generally the idea. Um, I would say that will handle the overwhelming majority of your cardiovascular conditioning. However, I do believe that a little bit of list cardio is essential for overall heart health. Um, and it doesn't need to be a lot, because if you're lifting heavy and you're doing GPP three times a week, uh, your overall conditioning is probably going to be on point. Uh, so at a certain threshold, we're just talking about making sure your heart stays healthy. So I would probably say maybe twice a week, do an hour of lists. It could be brisk walking, riding a bike, whatever. I would do a little bit of list cardio still just for your overall heart health. Uh, it's probably not going to significantly affect your conditioning though at this point, because if you're doing that type of GPP three times a week, in addition to lifting, uh, you're probably pretty damn fit in terms of cardiovascular <laughs> uh, conditioning and all of that. Uh, you're just trying to get a little more with the list so that you get a little more endurance on top of it. But yeah, man, I mean, if you're you're doing that type of GBP, the sled drags uh, and prowlers and farmers walk three times a week, um, your, your cardiovascular health is probably going to be on point if you're doing any significant workloads with these. Uh, and I really like to see guys doing that when I see someone who's really focused on fitness and they're just their personal athleticism. Uh, combining weight training with good conditioning work like that is really, really uh, beneficial. And I really like to see guys doing stuff like that. Uh, so keep up what you're doing, brother, but maybe once or twice a week, do at least an hour of list cardio. Maybe even just once will probably be enough with all the other conditioning you're doing just to keep everything uh, balanced out the way that you would want it for your overall fitness. All right, uh, next question. Do women really need to train their chest muscles directly if they don't compete in anything? I'm going to put my girlfriend on a weight training program while I'll have her do all the basic compound lifts, but I'm thinking of her uh, having her ditch the bench press completely and just have her do overhead press instead. Or is it a bad idea? You know what? It, it honestly depends upon what her goals are and what she's trying to achieve. Is she going to get perfect chest development uh, while doing no direct chest work? Probably not. Is she going to see some chest development just from the overhead press if she's doing a lot of it? Yeah. And that might be enough to give her what she wants. She might not be wanting to add much pectoral muscle, just a little bit of a lift to keep her, you know, boobs from sagging a bit. Um, and, you know, honestly, if you were to ask me from an athletic perspective, if someone had to pick overhead work versus just chest pressing uh, for overall athleticism, I would lean them in the direction of overhead pressing anyways. So it really kind of depends on her goals. But the, the question I would ask you is, um, if you want to keep her strength and musculature completely well-rounded, completely well-rounded, um, why do you need to completely cut it out? There's, there's nothing to stop you from having her throw in a, a set of dips or two every week. It won't take much out of your day of recovery to do a set of dips once a week. Uh, you really won't even notice a difference negatively, and that will probably be enough to keep her balanced out if she's doing a lot of overhead work. Uh, so something you need to consider when we start talking about cutting out uh, essential, not essential, but at least basic movements. Um, when they, they really can be done as a secondary role and a secondary exercise, it doesn't take much of your time. Um, you need to ask yourself the question of, is there any real benefit to me removing this? You know, sp particularly when you're talking about, can you just squeeze in one set of something somewhere in the week? Because that, that's honestly the difference we're talking about here, just to make sure that you cover that uh, basic movement pattern, uh, such as again, just doing dips or something. Um, so we really need to step back and ask ourselves, what benefit do I gain from not doing this? Uh, also could be a point because oftentimes these are time constraints when we're trying to get people in and out of the gym efficiently. But you know what? Doing one set of dips somewhere on your way out the door is going to add, what, 60 seconds to your gym time? That's not meaningful. You're not going to notice that time difference. Uh, so sometimes people can get a little bit of tit for tat when they do this, or you have people who specifically don't want to overdevelop a certain muscle. But you know what? Uh, when you're limiting volume to that degree, uh, overdeveloping a muscle really isn't uh, a real concern. It's not something that's actually going to happen in that case. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about it a whole lot. All right, next question. Hey, Jason, I read somewhere that BCAAs have a caloric content of 4 calories per gram, but I've seen some BCAA supplements, such as Cyvation Extend, have nutritional labels that show zero calories. 
Is the supplement company lying or does the body break down the BCAAs differently and it doesn't actually store the calories? Thanks, Jason. I love the content. Um, the companies are lying. Flat out. Uh, branched chain amino acids have a caloric value and it's higher than zero. It's higher than one per gram. So why they're doing that, who knows? I have no idea why this company is choosing to do that. Um, now, a lot of people will say things like, well, yeah, because it doesn't store them. Well, you know what? Storing calories doesn't mean that foods don't have caloric values. Uh, you don't generally store alcohol. If you were to go drink pure drinking alcohol or even water down, water down some Everclear that has no uh, carb calories in it outside of just the alcohol, you know what? You don't store any of that alcohol anywhere either. But does that mean it's not energy? It doesn't have calories? Your body will burn it as a preferential fuel source before it even burns glucose. But it still has calories because it's being burned for fuel, leaving your body free to store other things. So this idea that because something isn't going to be stored that it doesn't have calories is scientifically untrue, uh, nutritionally untrue. And uh, you know what? I'm just going to be frank here. Uh, my dealings with starvation tells me from the past that it doesn't surprise me one bit that they put zero on there even when they know better. Um, uh, again, I think some people have some idea of a little bit of my history with some of the upper management uh, with Cyvation. Um And yeah, I don't consider them to be a reputable company. And no, it doesn't shock me one bit that they've taken something that has actual calories in it and labeled it as zero arbitrarily on their label. Um, I would expect nothing less from such a company. But uh, to really answer the question, branch chain amino acids do have calories. Anyone telling you they don't uh, is bullshitting you. They're lying to you. But you know what? We are talking about a pretty microscopic amount of calories. Um, is it that significant in the grand scheme of things? Are you going to notice 10 calories difference per day? Absolutely not. Not going to affect you in any meaningful way. But to label it as zero would be patently untrue because I can assure you if you were to consume the whole bottle, and uh, end up consuming 300 grams of branched chain amino acids in one day, every single day it will most definitely affect what happens on your scale. Um, I can assure you that if you were eating maintenance calories and you added that in, the scale would start going up. Not because you're storing the branched chain amino acids, but because you're burning them as a fuel source at that point and storing other things that you eat. All right, uh, next question. Hey Jason, you demand. I'm running the cutting version of your novice program, but I stopped doing straight bar curls since they made my forearms hurt. Is, is this just a matter of flexing my wrist too much? Thanks. Uh, no, straight bar curls do hurt a lot of people's uh, forearms or the wrist in some cases, depending on how you grip it. That's the reason uh, easy curl, curl bars were invented. Now, the thing is easy curl bars work the biceps less also, which also makes them not necessarily the best out there but that device was invented specifically for this problem um, but what I would recommend if you want to continue to do the straight bar curls is that you find a grip spacing that doesn't make your wrists or your forearms hurt and you learn to trail with your hands behind your wrist a little bit instead of up like this see my hand just a subtle difference trail behind on the way up that will remove some of the cramping of the floor, forearm flexors that might be happening there. But you're also going to need to find a grip spacing that works. And the interesting thing is, you know it's not the supinated position of the hand causing it, because if you go do curls with dumbbells, you don't have the same problem. Why? Because it allows your arm to track in its normal range of motion with them independent. You just have to find that same grip spacing on the uh, straight bar curl. Now, a few people out there can never find that position and they're always going to have a little pain, in which case their options are uh, don't do curls if you don't want or do curls with dumbbells. Problem solved. Uh, you'll be able to keep your arms in that natural tracking and natural plane of motion and it's in the arc you want it in uh, with dumbbells anyway. So, you know, if straight bar curls can't be done without pain or where they don't feel right, then use dumbbells. Problem solved. It's not a big deal. Uh, totally fixable. But don't use the easy curl bar to, uh, to do that. I, I know they're very popular. Every gym has them. Uh, but they're kind of a solution to a problem that doesn't really exist. A whole piece of equipment has been made because some people can't <laughs> learn to use dumbbells for some reason, choose not to. Or because they simply can't find the right grip spacing. And the, and the fact of the matter is 
the easy curl bar actually works the bicep slightly less than the straight bar. So it's putting you at a disadvantage. It's a device that really should have never been invented uh, to resolve this problem. It's simply unnecessary. Uh, but like I said, ultimately, if you can't fix the problem with any of the advice I gave there, go to dumbbells. And even in my novice program, I give you the option. If you look at the program closely, I give you the option of doing either straight bar curls or incline dumbbell curls, whichever one you prefer. So in that case, uh, the incline dumbbell curls might be the way to go for you personally. Problem solved. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time in part two.